Hello, it's Randy Rhodes. Here's a clip from our show and go to randyrhodes.com for the whole thing and a podcast. Buy a stinking podcast. Mary had a little man, man, man. The fault. We believe that all men are created equal. To the magnificent mosaic that is America. From radio beacon to radio beacon. I have a dream. Change has come to America. Believe me. Knock, knock. Who's there? Hey. It's a figment of your imagination. Randy Rhodes Show. Turn up your mind. Well, I have a very good relationship, as you know, with Steve Bannon. Uh, Steve's been a friend of mine for a long time. Long I like time. Steve a lot. Steve is very committed. He's a friend of mine, and he's very committed to getting things passed. I like Mr. Bannon. He's a friend of mine. <laughs> Bannon has, has, you know, I, I like him a lot. He's, he's actually a very good guy. Steve's a good guy. Steve is a, a very good guy. <laughs> no, now he's sloppy, Steve. He's earned a nickname. Uh, Little Marco, uh, Lion Ted, Crooked Hillary. He's earned a nickname now. This is how much uh, the Trump despises his good longtime friend, who apparently was only charged with getting the creamer after George Papadopoulos would get the coffee. Oh, man. This is unbelievable, right? That, was that it? Yeah. It's it's uh, just freaking unbelievable. And, uh, you know, now uh, that the, 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 there's a whole bunch of stuff, uh, it's like, woo, the new year is off and running now. See, I told you 2018 would be a good one because I, I, 2017 was too expensive. It cost us $1.5 trillion to get $12 in a tax cut if you make 60 grand. It's not a good, uh, you know, it's not a good bet. I don't think anybody, you know, at any of the investment firms would, uh, you know, ca- would counsel you. Go ahead, take $12 a week. And in exchange, we'll put $1.5 trillion on your tab. That's a good deal. You know, I just don't think. So uh, 2017 was just uh, too expensive is what it was. And too freaky for most of us. So now all of a sudden, uh, Bannon is, um, you know, nobody can figure out what Steve Bannon is doing. What is Steve Bannon doing? Why does Steve Bannon all of a sudden, uh, you know, earn the nickname Sloppy Steve? Why all of a sudden? Now, you see, if we said it or when we said it, (laughs) you know, that he was just uh, uh, he looked like a a homeless guy wearing double shirts and, you know, that it was skin covering up skin because he was really Satan underneath. And, you know, making all the observations about what a snake this man is, what a what a, a white supremacist, just this shy of a Nazi. Okay, because he doesn't give, uh, you know, the rousing speech wasn't really up to the caliber of a real Nazi who gave, you know, they gave the best speeches. Even in German, they sounded intimidating. Right. And so he was just this shot. So now no one can figure out why is he doing this? Well, you know, you know me. I'm always too smart for the room. I know exactly why Bannon is doing this. Okay, but first, I, I just thought I would tease you just a bit. Uh, with why is he doing what is he doing I don't understand why he's doing I have this great relation now all of a sudden he's sending out everybody he's sending out Sarah the wall (laughs) Steve is despicable he's disgusting I don't know what's wrong with him and the president hardly knew him and you know it's like uh, he he was a coffee boy on stage but of course the president signed an executive order making Steve Bannon part of the National Security Council so as I explain to you what Steve Bannon is doing today I want you to understand that Steve Bannon has some of the most confidential classified top secret information about the United States about our intelligence a gathering about sources and methods and placement in the world where all of our spies are. I mean, he's he was part of the National Security Council. Michael Flynn is also out there. He was the National Security Advisor. I mean, these these people are dangerous, loose cannons that are out there. So now Trump is uh, is trashing Bannon globally okay he's like all over the place trying to uh, you know undo the friendship that he did do with bannon you know bannon was the one who gave him the idea for the voter fraud commission bannon was the one who gave him the idea to say that there were nice nazis in charlottesville uh, you know bannon is the architect of so many the muslim ban so many virulent vile racist white supremacist uber nationalist crap that we suffered through for the low low bargain basement price of 1.5 trillion dollars last year oh yeah we paid for the privilege uh and now all of a sudden the deputy press secretary a a dude you never heard of so he's going to be a coffee boy too you never heard of him but he's there he's uh the deputy press secretary to the wall sarah huckabee sanders his name is hogan gidley i swear to god you can't make this crap up 
Hogan Gidley. Check this out. Well, that was then and this is now. And obviously over the course of, of Bannon, Mr. Bannon's time in the White House, uh, you've seen the results that he, pre he produced, which was zero, and the president fired him for it. It's obvious that Mr. Bannon spent his time in the White House talking to Mr. Wolf as opposed to doing his job and preparing <laughs> the president for victories. You just pointed out the fact that um, he had not really done anything in the White House. You're pointing to a few quotes that the president had said about Mr. Bannon. But right now, Mr. Bannon came out and lied about the president, hmm. attacked his own family. So right, all bets about, are off, about, all bets are off now. What Sanders today saying uh, that they weren't particularly close? She used the past <laughs> tense. The president in the past tense is saying they were very good friends. But so that who's a liar, mean, Sarah Sanders or the president? I mean, you know, I mean, this is. <laughs> yeah, that's ridiculous. The only liar here is Steve Bannon. No, Sarah Sanders lies at for a living, and the president of the United States lies because he can't tell the truth. He is incapable of telling the truth. Um, Steve Bannon is a vile human being. Uh, the credibility that I would give him for uh, 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 picking candidates like, you know, child molesters or uh, Kelly Ward out in uh, Nevada or, you know, people who are fit for the job is zero. Is there, and these two deserve each other. They, they lit, and Sarah Sanders deserves to work for, I don't know, anybody that I would curse with working for Donald Trump, but she sure deserves it, right? Um, the White House has said there were false statements in this book. The president's lawyer has said there were libelous statements. Could you just give a few examples of things that have been said in this book that are false that you would like to set the record straight on? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go through every single page of the book, but there are uh, numerous examples of falsehoods that take place in the book. I'll give you one just because it's really easy. The fact that uh, there was a claim that the president didn't know who John Boehner was is pretty ridiculous considering the majority of you have seen photos and frankly some of you have even tweeted out that the president uh, not only knows him but has played golf with him tweeted about him uh, I mean that's pretty simple and pretty basic uh, ages of employees which would be super easy to fact check or wrong again ages there are numerous mistakes but I'm not gonna waste my time or the country's time going page by page uh, talking about a book that's complete fantasy and just full of tabloid gossip because it's sad pathetic and our administration and our focus is going to be on moving the country forward yeah Sean? right thanks a lot sarah i read the cease and desist letter that was sent by the president's lawyers to both michael wolf and henry holt the publisher of his book which seeks to stop the sale of his book did the president's lawyers share with the president the idea that this is a prior restraint and that prior restraints are generally unconstitutional? Uh, I'm not sure about specific uh, details of the conversation ah. between the president and his personal attorneys, but I would refer you to them for questions. <sighs> she lies for a living, okay, is what she does. She lies for a living. Uh, the point of Michael Wolf saying that uh, the president asked who's that in response to John Boehner should be your son of a bitch, you should make him chief of staff, is to show that the president is losing his mind. And uh, the point of him saying, Michael Wolf saying in the book, that the president walked past his longtime acquaintances, longtime friends at Mar-a-Lago the other night at New Year's Eve was to show you that the president is like uh, experience some sort of memory loss that the president is somehow lost lost it whether it's to uh, senility or to something like alzheimer's or to uh you know side effects from drugs that he takes you know for various issues that he has that is why and so she's a well it's just ridiculous. he didn't put it in there to say that the president was an idiot he put it in there to say that the president is losing it which is what people have been saying about the president, and it's an open secret in Washington, D.C. That is what this book shows. That is the information that people like Maggie Haberman, people like Steve Schmidt at the New York Times, people at the Washington Post, uh, Entus, uh, people like Jim Acosta, people like uh, 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 Manu Raju, people who cover Capitol Hill, they all know this. Everybody knows it. Everyone knows that the president is somehow... Uh, very disconnected to reality.
So now they're all out there trashing this book, trashing Michael Wolff, trashing Steve Bannon, right, as as being a liar, which is just so rich because the president himself is a world heavyweight champion liar. Now, here's what happens when Hogan Gidley, meet Hogan Gidley, everybody, the deputy press secretary at the White House, is confronted with factual information about two sources who confirm that what Michael Wolf wrote occurred at a dinner between Roger Ailes, Steve Bannon, a woman named um, Janice Min, who is the co-owner of The Hollywood Reporter, uh, and Michael Wolf, who arranged for this dinner. Also, when he was working for The Hollywood Reporter, all got together and... Uh, And CNN is trying to tell him, uh, but we have more than one source on this story. So what do you say to this? Check out what they do. Janice Min, editor for The Hollywood Reporter, uh, was at that dinner, uh, which included Roger Ailes and Steve Bannon. She said uh, that it was an astonishing dinner. Everything in the book about it is is absolutely accurate. One of the exchanges that was reported in the book about that dinner went like this. What has he gotten himself into with the Russians, pressed Ailes. That's referring, of course, to the former Fox News chief, Roger Ailes. Mostly, said Bannon, he went to Russia and he thought he was going to meet Putin, but Putin couldn't give an expletive about him, so he's kept trying. So now a person who's at that dinner says that actually happened. Your response? Right, but, 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 but Mr. Bannon uh, wasn't even there during these, these meetings. Yes, these he conversations. was. So I, I don't exactly know how he's credible in this. I'm not exactly sure What, what who are you she referring is, to when he wasn't know, there? He was obviously at the dinner because he had I a conversation know. with Roger <laughs> Ailes. I, I'm saying I don't know anybody else at that meeting who's, or that dinner who's corroborated that story yes, at Janice all. Yes, Janice Min was so, there from The Hollywood Reporter, <laughs> so she's you, corroborating but, you're use, but that's what I'm saying. You're using one instance. I'm saying who else was at the dinner? Well, now that's two people. <laughs> who else is that's corroborating That's Bannon and another person at the dinner. Roger Ailes is obviously no longer alive. <laughs> okay, but that's what I'm saying. You're using one person to try and make your point. I'm telling you there are multiple pe- people at the dinner. You're just picking and choosing which well, one to believe. I'm just picking the two of them that the have point. spoken. That, that's I, all, the only two but that I'll we go have. Back no one to... else at the dinner has come out and said it didn't happen uh, as of yet, of course. Uh, right, absolutely. So that's my point. You're cherry picking that. So CNN, who does a good job trying to make sure that an immigration meeting happens at the White House and the attendees are there, you're just running with this as though it were fact. And that speaks more about CNN than it does Look, about Look, there's President all kinds Trump. of rules on sourcing. Often uh, two sources would be, uh, would be what you would go with, especially when they're named. As as they are. Yes. Uh, two sources would be sufficient for, m- for me as well. Two sources is always sufficient. The only people at this dinner is the dead Roger Ailes, Steve Bannon, who Hogan Gidley says wasn't even there. Oh, yeah, he was there. Janice Min, who also went on TV last night and said, yes, this dinner really happened and these things were really said and Bannon was there and he very uh, profoundly refused to drink because him and Roger Ailes were picking the cabinet. Oh, my God, Roger Ailes of Fox News was picking the cabinet. I mean, and that Trump made overtures to Russia, to Putin, and Putin didn't give a shit about him. And so he kept trying. That's what Ben... So those are the people at the dinner along with Michael Wolf. So then you have three sources. You have Michael Wolf, you have Janice Mann, and you have Steve Bannon. Roger Ailes is dead. Oh, my God. Commercial free, on demand, whenever, wherever listening experience. Visit randyroads.com for your personal premium podcast today. Smoke them if you got them. Yes, it's Herky Jerky in 2018. And for 2018, they're starting off with $5 off full packs of delicious beef smokies. Since Herky Jerky started in 1992, Herky Jerky's delicious beef smokies have been one of the most popular items and for very good reason. The 100% beef meat sticks have just the right amount of snap on the outside and flavor on the inside. They're low cholesterol, high protein, guaranteed fresh, and the perfect snack for any occasion. This month, they're ringing in the new year with a discount of $5 off all full packs of their three kinds of Smokies, mild, honey, and jalapeno. The full packs are one and a half pounds. They include 30 long sticks. The discount applies to full packs only, but as always, if you buy any two packs of their products, you'll get free shipping. 
We hope everybody had a fun and safe holiday season, and we look forward to you enjoying Herky Jerky in 2018 with the absolute best and most delicious jerky anywhere in the world. Visit HerkyJerky.com now. Again, HerkyJerky.com. Enter promo code SMOKY. Hello, Progressive Voices Tune In listeners. I'm Casey Hobbs. And I'm Shane Mason, and we're the hosts of Nurse Talk Radio. Here's what we're talking about this week. Just explain to me for a minute. So the reports must show that there is great harm to the community, yes. both in the land and in people's health. It's showing that in communities where this particular kind of gas extraction is happening, people have headaches and animals have been sick and kids are having nosebleeds and a wide array of other signs and symptoms. But the other thing that we need to note is that these chronic exposures are probably teeing them up for longer term chronic diseases and, uh, you know, perhaps diseases that we're going to see later on. Unfortunately, then the people will be far into their illnesses and it'll be harder for them to get any good health care as a result of years of that. Amanda Krantz is the founder and CEO of Doja.com, a website connecting patients and caregivers for the sole purpose of sharing gratitude. You know, the person you want to thank may not be coming in for the next couple of shifts. Now, if you leave a paper card or leave cookies, you don't know if it got to the person that you wanted so to thank. So true, and oftentimes it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, so now we wrote pre-written responses. Thank you so much for your kind words. It means the most to me. And patients can attach photos as well. And so, you know, it was great to see how well you're doing now. Yeah. Those things mean so much to the patient, and it's still no HIPAA violation. Get on in 90 seconds, share your gratitude, be done. You might not think of thanking them until years later. I've been in nursing a long time and when I was 25, taking care of a gentleman who had had a heart attack and on the fourth day I walk into his room and he says, I wanted to thank you. Mm -hmm. I got you flowers because you really turned around my thinking about male nurses. And I am standing there wearing earrings and I said, thank you so much. I appreciate it. (laughs) Check out our show at nursetalksite.com and listen every Saturday and Sunday right here on Progressive Voices. Things Randy at RandyRhodes.com. Go, go for launch. Speaking truth to power, the Randy Rhodes Show. Oh, boys and girls, here is Janice Min, who was also at that dinner. She is the third source because you've got Michael Wolf, who a- actually organized this dinner, okay? So, Michael Wolf, the journalist, uh, is at this dinner. Steve Bannon, who confirms the dinner, is at this dinner. J- uh, Roger Ailes, who's dead, is at this dinner. And Janice Min, the uh, editor of The Hollywood Reporter, is at this dinner. According to the book, Roger Ailes yes. asked Steve Bannon, quote, what has he gotten himself into with the Russians, meaning then President-elect Trump? Bannon responded, quote, he went to Russia and he thought he was going to meet Putin, but Putin couldn't give a uh, Shit. poop, a different word you used, <laughs> yes. about him. So he's kept, so he's yes. kept trying. I, I'm just wondering, did you hear that? And if, is that accurate? You know, I can't say I, I I heard a discussion. I couldn't say verbatim, word for word, because I wasn't taking notes. But that sounds accurate to me. I was the dinner. There were just six. There were just six people, and I was seated between uh, Steve Bannon and Roger Ailes. And there was this um, frantic back and forth between the two of them. And it was it was it was unbelievable. It was like seeing the the Republican agenda being laid out for the next four years. Mm. Uh, one of the things that was very clear about Steve from Steve Bannon. And I just, you know, and it was so interesting. Steve Bannon walks in quite late, and he's offered a drink right away, and he, he very demonstratively says, "No, I'm not going to drink." And then he sits down and has some dinner, and really just goes into it. And he and Roger Ailes, the two of them, uh, they were basically plotting the future of the Republican Party uh, in the Trump administration. And mm. uh, there were so many interesting things said. Whoops. They started out, um, they started out talking about the. Uh, they, they were building the cabinet together. Oh, my God. And uh, uh, one of the things they started talking about, that, which was an imminent subject right then, was Rudy Giuliani and uh, <laughs> his disappointment over not being named Secretary of State. State! And, uh, and Ailes, Ailes, is, Ailes is so funny. He just said, you know what? And he's sort of casual. And he's like, just tell Rudy. Just, I know what you do with Rudy. You just tell Rudy. Uh, just get Rudy uh, photographed twice, coming once or twice coming out of Air Force One. Then Rudy's all good. Oh, wow. my God. And there, there, there uh, then are, they started there, talking about John. Sorry, there, there are a couple other quotes I just need sorry. to ask you about, which seem to speak to, yes, to Bannon's assessment of Donald Trump's intellect. Again, from the book, Roger Ailes says, I wouldn't give yes. Donald too much to think about. Bannon's response, too much, too little, doesn't necessarily 
change things. Again, that exchange, is that something you heard or, or, or how did you interpret it if you did? Yes, yes. I, I, there was, there was an a <laughs> ongoing theme and it was, to be clear, Bannon had a fondness for Donald Trump in the night, but he, I can't say he didn't think, it was almost he had a paternal role to Donald Trump. Hmm. He, if, like I, he I, saw I remember one of the first Donald things Trump? I said to Michael, he saw himself in control of Donald Trump. Oh, snap. Let's listen to Gidley one more time, okay? Let's. Janice Min, editor for The Hollywood Reporter, uh, was at that dinner, uh, which, which included Roger Ailes and Steve Bannon. She said uh, that it was an astonishing dinner. Everything in the book about it is, is absolutely accurate. One of the exchanges that was reported in the book about that dinner went like this. What has he gotten himself into with the Russians, pressed Ailes. That's referring, of course, to the former Fox News chief, Roger Ailes. Mostly, said Bannon, he went to Russia and he thought he was going to meet Putin, but Putin couldn't give an expletive about Shit. him. So he's kept trying. So now a person who's at that dinner says that actually happened. Your response? Right, but, 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 but Mr. Bannon uh, wasn't even there during these, these meetings, these conversations. Oh, my God. The lying. The lying. And, you know, and, and when, you, when you listen to, you know, uh, what one person at the dinner says that the, she heard, and you read Michael Wolff spoke about what he heard, and you hear Bannon's word about what he said, and then you listen to the Trump administration lie and call it tabloid trash or undocumentable or wrong or Steve Bannon wasn't even at that dinner. Um... Yeah, he was at the dinner, as a matter of fact, and uh, so was um, Janice Min, and he's, well, you know, uh, there were other people at the dinner. Yes, but Roger Ailes is dead, you see, and the other person that was at this dinner is the author, Michael Wolff, uh, so you have three people, uh, one is dead, so that's four. Uh, what is wrong with you? So I, I don't exactly know how he's credible in this. I'm not exactly sure What, what are you she referring is, to when he wasn't there? He was obviously at the dinner because he had I a conversation know, with Roger right, Ailes. I, I'm saying I don't know anybody else at that meeting who's, or that dinner who's corroborated that story yes, at Janice all. Yes, Janice Min was so, there from the Hollywood Reporter, yeah. so but she's you, corroborating but, you're use, but that's what I'm saying. You're using one instance. I'm saying who else was at the dinner? Well, now that's two people. <laughs> who else is that's corroborating That's Bannon and another person at the dinner. Roger Ailes is obviously no longer alive. Okay, but that's what I'm saying. You're using one person to try and make your point. I'm telling you. No, she's using three people. She's using Steve Bannon. She's using uh, Michael Wolf, And she's using Janice Mann, who is an editor at The uh, Hollywood Reporter. Uh, uh, you know, the lying is insane. Insane. And this is what they're going to do now to uh, Steve Bannon. You know, we hardly knew him. He was getting the creamer. Uh, he was, uh, you know, just, a, 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 you know, a, a side thing. Uh, of course, you know, Trump uh, authored an executive order putting him on the National Security Council and uh, also appointed Michael Flynn, who obviously has flipped and is now cooperating with Mueller. Uh, but here, here's Michael Wolf. Michael Wolf uh, is finally, you know, they, they moved up the release of this book. You know, when you heard the question, the last question asked of Sarah Sanders uh, yesterday, and he said, uh, is the White House aware that, uh, you know, trying to ban a book before it's published is something called prior restraint? Meaning you can't ban speech before the speech is spoken. That would be prior restraint. And so they're saying... On every level, this president has mangled any sort of legal claim he might have. Plus, he's a public figure, the most public figure. And public figures can't bring defamation lawsuits, okay? Uh, so, uh, what the hell are you doing? And she says, oh, well, I'm going to refer to, uh, you know, his personal account. We have nothing to do with that. That's a lie also, okay? So, here's Michael Wolf, uh, And, uh, you know, they asked him... What do you make of the fact that the White House is calling you tabloid trash and a liar and saying everything that you wrote is made up and all this crap, okay? And that, oh, and Sarah Sanders said yesterday, you spent no time with the press. In fact, we banned him from the White House and we said he couldn't come to the White House. And meanwhile, Michael Wolf is in the White House. He's freaking there. He says, I authorized zero access to the White House, actually turned you down many times, said he never spoke to you for the book. It's full of lies, misrepresentations and sources that don't exist. So as good a place to start as any. Did you talk to the what, president? What was I doing there if um, um, if he didn't want me to be there? Well, let me ask you, did you talk to the president? Did you interview him for this book? I, 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 absolutely, I absolutely spoke to the president, whether he realized it was an interview or not. You see. Um, 
I, I don't know, but it certainly was not off the record. I did, and you spoke to him at the White House after he was sworn in? Uh, I spoke to him after the inauguration, yes. And I had spoken to, I mean, I've spent about uh, three hours with the president over the course of the campaign in, in the White House. So my window into Donald Trump is, um, um, is pretty significant. But even more to the point, I spent this, I spent, and this was really sort of the point of the book, I spoke to people who spoke to the president on a daily, sometimes minute by minute basis. So this this book was really, I mean, in a sense, in a sense, there was one question on my mind when I began this book. What is it like to work with Donald Trump? How can you work with <laughs> Donald Trump? And what is the um, um, how do you feel having worked with Donald Trump? <laughs> So that, you know, I mean, if, if if credibility is is the the key that unlocks the door, uh, that is the mystery of the Donald Trump presidency, then, you know, uh, who are you going to believe? The Donald Trump uh, administration who has gone through people like, uh, you know, uh, women in the Billy Joel concert went through toilet paper. Disgusting women. Uh, but. Who are you going to believe? A guy with a tape recorder who obviously was in the White House, who obviously spent hours with the president, who obviously spent hours and hours talking to, uh, obviously, Steve Bannon. I mean, he's quoted ad nauseum in this book, and he is not uh, speaking up and saying that they got it wrong. Who are you going to believe? And, and that was one of the questions, okay? They are calling you a liar, Michael Wolff. Do you have recordings to clear this up, because the president is saying it's full of lies, that you didn't have the access you said you had. You know, I think we one of the things we have to have to count on is that Donald Trump will attack. He will send lawyers letters. This is a a a 35 year history of how he approaches everything. Do you have recordings of some of these interviews and some of these conversations? Well, I, I, I work like every journalist works. So I have recordings. I have notes. Um, I am certainly and absolutely in every way comfortable with everything I've reported in this book. Would you release any of those recordings since your credibility is being questioned? I, my, my credibility is being questioned by a man who has less credibility than <laughs> perhaps anyone who has ever walked on earth at this point. Before I leave it, I will say the president, tw the tweet alludes to, quote, your past. It says I, it. it I assume referring to a profile about you in 2004 in the New Republic, the reporter said of you, the scenes in your writing aren't recreated so much as created, springing from Wolf's imagination rather than actual knowledge uh, You know, knowledge I've written, of the best. I've, written um, I've written many books. I've written millions upon millions of words. I don't think there has ever been one correction. So you stand by everything in the book, nothing made up. Absolutely everything in the book. Whoops. Whoops. And he's got tapes and he's got the notes over there, you know, and, and, and he said he talked to Trump for three. You know, it, Trump says he never talked to this guy. But, you know, with this man, Trump, it's as likely that he doesn't remember talking to him as he is lying. And, you know, we're just going to have to decide which it is or if it's a combination of uh, all of the above. So, you know, <sighs> what this book is about is about the people who know that this man was unfit to be the president of the United States to begin with, that Steve Bannon understood this and was using Donald Trump to promote his uber-nationalist, white supremacist, uh, 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 isolationist, pull-us-out-of-the-world agenda, and that Donald Trump was the perfect uh, vessel for Steve to pour all of this racist, a uh, uh, white supremacist, uber nationalist, uber isolationist position into because Trump didn't give a rat's ass about anything except being loved. And Bannon knew just how to. That explains why Bannon said, you know, uh, Donald Trump is a great man, even the night before last on his Sirius XM radio show. And that he's on Sirius XM. And we aren't, should tell you everything you need to know about Sirius XM. But I'm just saying, it, it, it is so amazing to me 
that everybody understands just how to manipulate Donald Trump to do a, I mean, China is manipulating Donald Trump. You want to know what's going on? Just a, a brief little sidestep into foreign policy. Okay, so we've just decided we're not going to give Pakistan any foreign aid. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, you know, North Korea and South Korea are talking to each other uh, ahead of the Olympics because, you know, uh, they see it as a, 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 a opening for the North Koreans to send uh, athletes into South Korea and the South Koreans can pick their brains and blah, 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 because they'll be very loyal. Whatever. Don't you understand that by doing this, we're throwing the entire world that depends on us for foreign aid, that depends on us to be uh, an honest broker, that depends on us for military support and all these other things, okay, that we are throwing them into the loving arms of China? Don't you get it? Don't you see it? Don't you understand it? Yes, you do. I do. The entire world does, except for Donald Trump. And this is Steve Bannon's wet dream. It's his wet dream that China become ascendant and America become an also ran. So, you know, you you, you want to, you want to, Michael Wolf says that 100% of the people that work for Donald Trump, to a man, to a woman, every single solitary person that has passed through and still is serving in this White House knows that Donald Trump is unfit for office. Every single one of them. Everyone around the president, senior advisors, family members, every single one of them questions his intelligence and fitness for office. Let me, let me put, a, put a, a marker in the, in the sand here. 100% of the people around him. Jared Kushner, his son-in-law, Ivanka Trump, question his fitness for office? E- every time I, I uh, and, and, and I want to be careful about who I spoke to because the nature of this kind of book is you kind of grant everyone a veil. But having, having said that, um, certainly Jared and Ivanka, in, in their current situation, mm-hmm, which is a, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. In a deep legal quagmire, mm-hmm. are putting everything on the president. Not <gasps> us, it's him. What, what are some of the ways the president <sighs> was described to you by those closest to him? You know, I will, I will tell you the one description that that everyone gave, everyone has in common. They all say he is like a child. And what they mean by that is he has a need for immediate gratification. It's all about him. I mean, this this letter for um, the cease and desist desist letter, I mean, I still have sources in the White House and I know everybody was going, (laughs) we should not be doing this, this is not smart. And he just insists, he just has to be satisfied in the moment. You said that these senior people insult his intelligence. What are the kinds of things people would say? <sighs> they say he's um, a, a moron, an idiot. Um, actually, there's a competition uh-huh. to sort of get to the bottom line here of who this man is. Let's remember, this man does not read, does not listen. So uh, he, he, he's, he's, like a, um, he's like a pinball, just, just, just shooting off the sides. Great. That's our president, everybody. And it only cost us $1.5 trillion on our credit card to have him. You want a statistic that will drive Donald Trump supporters and Donald Trump insane? Do you know that 11 million more people voted against Donald Trump than voted for Donald Trump? 11 million people voted against Donald Trump. More, more. 3 million more voted for Hillary Clinton, right? Uh, Gary Johnson, remember Gary? A little stoned, but remember Gary? Gary doesn't remember you. He's a little, uh, you know... 4.5 4.5 million people voted for him. Jill Stein got one and a half million votes. And Evan McCullen from Utah got almost a million votes, 700,000. And then there were a million plus write-ins. So 11 million Americans voted against Donald Trump then voted for him to be president. And this is what drives him crazy. Clear for takeoff. Randy Rose. Air Force. Air Force. Air Force. 
Whether you're listening to me, Mark Levine, each Monday and Wednesday, or me, Leslie Marshall, each Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, you can hear us 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern Time on the Progressive Voices Network. Here's a sample of what you'll hear. 2017 is hopefully, if not the beginning of the end, the end of the beginning of Donald Trump. This is a test of America. And hopefully, like that little piece of smallpox that they put in to immunize you to the great disease, hopefully this will be a wake-up call. The fight to protect our press, in the fight to protect our immigrants, Native Americans and African Americans, LGBT people and, and Jews and women and anyone this guy attacks, frankly, the to, to protect the middle class, to protect poor people, to protect innocent Americans who are just trying to live their lives, that we will immunize ourselves and make us stronger. And for better and for worse, this was a year all about Donald Trump. Actually, I think I should say for worse and for even worse, it was a year about Donald Trump. From our trepidations, our fear at the beginning of the year of what would happen once he became president on January 20th, to our incredible astonishment at how awful a president he was, Uh, the tweets alone showed a man who is not only incapable of understanding public policy. He has no interest in it. He just makes up stuff as he goes along, and most of it is false. It really showed a little bit about who our country is. I think the Trump administration in 2017 reminds me of those disaster movies. You know the ones. Things start out where things are okay, but you fear something really bad is going to happen, and then really bad things do happen and it gets worse and worse and worse and then just when you think it'll be okay it gets even worse but then as the movies end somehow the heroes regroup and find a way out of the darkness find a way to stop whatever fire or intense hurricane or horrible disaster maybe it's godzilla is wrecking the village and they come together and they count their dead and they hug each other and they realize after beating the monster they will live to see a better tomorrow one of the biggest stories is activism that culminated yes in the virginia and alabama elections but began the day after inauguration the whole world was telling donald trump we don't accept your vision of hatred and fear. And that activism is definitely what brought us to to the great uh, elections at the end of 2017. And frankly, I think it's going to propel us on to 2018. I think the lessons of 2017 were we were complacent in 2016. We didn't think this terrible thing could happen. And now we know it can and it does. And we're ready to fight it. Again, that's Mark Levine every Monday and Wednesday. And Leslie Marshall each Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern Time on the Progressive Voices Network. All things Randy at RandyRhodes.com. Go, go for launch. Speaking truth to power, the Randy Rhodes Show. One of the more disturbing observations you make in the book is that the president's close advisors, people around him, have noticed him repeating stories expression for expression you say within a short period of time in a shortening period so they've all tracked this that it used to be um i know people would point out that in the beginning it was like every 25 or 30 minutes you would get the same three stories repeated oh God. now it's um the same three stories in every 10 minutes. Oh, and, and what's the suggestion there? Because that goes beyond saying, okay, the president's not an intellectual. I mean, what's, what's, what are you arguing there? You say, for example, that he was at Mar-a-Lago and didn't recognize lifelong friends. I, he, I, I will quote Steve Bannon. He's lost it. Oh, God, he's lost. Oh, God. All right. So what game is Bannon playing here? All right. Th- this is the key question. I'll let Michael Wolf take a stab at it and then I'll tell you what I think. OK, let's talk about Steve Bannon, because here's somebody who was on the record with you, made some pretty bold assertions, as you mentioned, has disparaged the president. And yet now in the last couple of days says he's a great man and nothing can separate us. What's Bannon doing well, here? I, I, I want to make one. I mean, the president has, has tried to put this. This book is about Steve Bannon. So let me let me say very forthrightly, this book is not about Steve Bannon. This book is about Donald Trump. Um, as for Steve Bannon, and I spoke to Steve as I spoke to many people throughout the length of the reporting here, and really saw a, a, a transformation, Mm-mm. not only of Steve, but of of everyone, but Steve, in a way, is most vivid, or his language is 
is the is the most vivid and very and the transformation was you know we thought this presidency was could work we thought donald trump is an interesting unique character and <laughs> and we might be able to do something here and they saw him over that time come to the conclusion he cannot do this job Oh, it's more than that, okay? Uh, Steve Bannon has to have known, just like we knew, just like you knew, just like 11 million Americans uh, who, you know, voted against Donald Trump, who wouldn't vote for Hillary Clinton, but 11 million more Americans uh, voted against Donald Trump than voted for Donald Trump, okay? Everybody knew that this man was, uh, you know, unhinged, that he had the intellect of a flea, that he was a, an egomaniac, a demagogue, a, a, a con man, a P.T. Barnum, uh, that he was in this for himself and that this was probably more about branding himself for the future for a Trump Tower Moscow or for another television network or for, you know, whatever his, uh, you know, branding desires were and that he never intended to be president. And he is completely and totally unable to serve as the uh, uh, commander in chief of the United States of America, let alone the chief diplomat or the chief law enforcement officer. I mean, honestly. The man understands zero about the Constitution, talks about the Bible, two Corinthians walk into a bar, okay? Says he eats his little cracker and he drinks his little wine, which is the only time he drinks. You know, and it's appealing to evangelicals and all this, uh, you know, I... Okay, so this is all the doing of a Steve Bannon. Steve Bannon uh, started this Make America Great Again movement. This white nationalist racist baiting appeal to the lowest common denominator so that America, he could he could burn America down to the ground, that America would be uh, uh, out of the world, America would be, you know, an island unto itself, a complete isolationist little, you know, uh, 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 Nazi uh, organization. This is Steve Bannon's wet dream. And he thought that Donald Trump was stupid enough, and that is why it's so important what Janice Min says, that Steve Bannon viewed Donald Trump in a paternal manner, that he felt he controlled Donald Trump, and that Donald Trump was really a child that you could parent. And when Steve Bannon, when Steve Bannon, I mean, listen, the influence that Steve Bannon still has on Donald Trump should never be underestimated. Remember, Donald Trump just endorsed a pedophile before the new year in a special election in Alabama. He, he got the president to say that Roy Moore, you should vote for Roy Moore. He did a robocall for Roy Moore. He went down to the border of Alabama. Wouldn't set foot in Alabama. I mean, this is how I told you. It, this is his plausible deniability. Well, I never went to Alabama. And people will forget that he went to Pensacola, which is 17 you know, miles away. OK, and that he he campaigned for Roy Moore, that he endorsed Roy Moore, that he made robocalls for Roy Moore, and that he was out there endorsing a pedophile saying, well, he says he didn't do it. He says he didn't do it. So, you know, what are you going to do? I mean, honestly, and when Bannon lost control of Donald Trump. It was when people started to report that Bannon was controlling Donald Trump. And Donald Trump said, oh, he's got zero control over me, zero, zero. He has no control. Like a little child, like he said to Hillary, remember during the debate where she said, you know, well, uh, perhaps Putin prefers, you know, a puppet. And he said, no puppet, no puppet, you're the puppet, you're the puppet, like a child, remember? And it was really strikingly scary to hear a person who was that close to becoming the president of the United States talk like that. Well, this is what Steve Bannon saw, and this is what Steve Bannon knew. So... When Steve Bannon went back to Breitbart, he was still, still endorsing Donald Trump. And, and he still does it because he knows this is the only way that he can keep the Make America Great Again movement alive. So what is Steve Bannon doing? I'll tell you what. Steve Bannon has always played a long game. He saw when Andrew Breitbart was still alive, he saw Breitbart as a platform. This is what he said, as a platform for the alt-right which is a really polite way of saying Nazis, white supremacists, Klan members, uh, Stormfront readers, uh, Reddit, uh, you know, uh, 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 crazies out there. Steve Bannon sees that they can get people elected because of things like the Electoral, uh, electoral College, because of things like primaries, 
uh, because he had the backing of the Mercers. He had tons of cash. He had access to millions of dollars of data. Uh, the Mercer family, there is no way they're coming out of this unscathed either with the data operation that they were running. Now all of a sudden, Diane Feinstein writes a letter and she says she wants to talk to Dan Scavino, the media manager for the Trump campaign, right? Uh, because Dan Scavino, I don't even know if you know this. Dan Scavino, who's in charge of the Trump media operation, was Donald Trump's golf caddy. That's who Dan Scavino is. These are the people that uh, Steve Bannon thought were fit to be around this president, okay? As he's sitting there with Roger Ailes putting together the president's cabinet at a dinner in front of reporters. Michael Wolf. And, and, you know, they said that the only reason and, and this is why people are pissed at Michael Wolf. And I get this. But, uh, you know, what are you going to do? Michael Wolf had a lot of off the record conversations. This dinner was one of them. And he put it in his book after giving assurances that it was off the record. That's why they're pissed at him, because he does do crap like that. But I'll tell you what, Michael Wolf is different from a CNN reporter or, 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 or a, a Reuters reporter or a New York Times reporter like a Maggie Haberman. They're, he's different because Michael Wolf doesn't need access. He doesn't need connections, you know, going forward because he's not going to report on uh, the Trump presidency anymore. Right. It's yeah. done. Right. This is what he does. I mean, he, he writes these uh, these p- these pieces of work like the, the he, he did the, the biography of Rupert Murdoch. OK, and he'll burn the bridge be- and tell you the truth, because he doesn't need the access where working reporters and you have to have uh, some respect for this, although it does irritate me. And, I, and the question for us is whether or not reporters who know that the president is a lunatic, that the president is unstable, that the president can uh, start a nuclear war without Congress, that the president is a unitary executive when it comes to issues like nuclear war, whether or not they should respect the -the off-the-record nature of some of their contacts, uh, you know, talking to them to preserve access, or whether they should finally come out and say, like USA Today did, who never, ever writes uh, you know, endorsements or negative uh, editorials about presidents. Uh, the Atlantic, I mean, once in a decade they'll do it, you know what I mean? But they are, they're breaking down that wall and they are t- trying to tell the American people we have a madman in the White House, that the emperor has no clothes, that he is a, a complete and utter fake, a phony, and, 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 and uh, just beyond management, beyond reason, beyond sanity. He He's just... Uh, 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 gone and and he's lost it and and you know the so here's what Bannon is doing Bannon is no hero in this okay trust me Bannon knows how to play the long game when Breitbart was still alive Bannon knew this could be the platform for his alt-right wet dream okay and that is what he said and Andrew Breitbart suddenly dies and there's there's Bannon just ready to take it over and turns it into this uber white supremacy uh, 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 fake news website that has so many people attracted to it and he sees all this you know is working so here's another thing Bannon knows so he knows how to play the long game he is a just short of a Nazi okay he really does believe uh, that Jews uh, you know are, are people that his children should not go to school with uh, he really did you know uh, uh, have a, a disgusting divorce where his wife said you know he's violent and, and all these things okay and he's attracted to Donald Trump because Donald Trump is also as smarmy as he is and he figures this is like a great vessel and when he loses control over Trump because he says he has control over Trump out loud in public and Trump fires him Bannon starts playing the long game But Bannon has contacts in the national security apparatus. Bannon knows Flynn. Bannon knows Manafort. Bannon knows Gates. Bannon knows Roger Stone. Bannon knows who George Papadopoulos is. Bannon knows that Carter Page went to Russia. He knows the whole story. He knows Jeff Sessions. He knows everything because he put this cabinet together. So when Bannon was outed, you know, as being uh, somebody that Donald Trump said had zero control over him and he's placed over there, Bannon makes one more try and says, okay, you're going to endorse this white supremacist candidate, Roy Moore, who's a lunatic also, who I want to be in the Senate because I'm building this alt-right, uh, you know, make America a great movement, and I need this guy in there, blah, blah, blah. Trump does it. Trump does it. Then this book comes out. Then this book comes out. So why did Bannon give all these quotes? 
He gave all these quotes because he knows that Jared is going to jail. He knows that Ivanka is going to jail. He knows that Manafort is going to jail. He knows that Gates is going to make a deal or go to jail. He knows Michael Flynn is going to has already made a deal so that he doesn't go to jail. He knows Michael Flynn's son, who is retweeting this white supremacist crap, is also making a deal and going to, or going to jail. He knows Roger Stone was in touch with WikiLeaks. He also knows that uh, 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 Donald Trump's ex golf caddy Dan Scavino, who was in charge of the media operation, was in touch with the Russians and did get information from the Russians. And pushed out this. He also knows that Donald Trump was the person who went to Putin in the first place and that all of this is going to uh, uh, explode and Donald Trump is guilty. That's what Steve Bannon knows. So Steve Bannon is playing the long game and distancing himself from Donald Trump, and it's not the other way around. Donald Trump isn't distancing himself from Steve Bannon by calling him sloppy Steve all of a sudden. Hell no. Bannon gave these uh, uh, trashy uh, uh, comments to Michael Wolff about Jared is, uh, is terrified, Ivanka is terrified, and, uh, uh, you know, all these things. Tra- because he's distancing himself from Donald Trump so he can live another day to pick another vessel through which the white supremacist movement will survive. And you see the people that he picks. He picks Roy Moore, who is completely blackmailable. He picks Kelly Ward, who is a bat crap crazy candidate in in, in Nevada. Okay, this is why Steve Bannon is doing what he's doing. You know, and, and, and when you listen to Fox News, they're going to sit there and they're going to try and tell, oh, the left loves Steve Bannon now because Steve Bannon gave dirt on their, you know, their fair haired boy, uh, Donald Trump. No, 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 no. The left does not. I'm the left. OK. And trust me, there are like five people that speak for the left and they're all my friends. And none of us think Steve Bannon is a good guy. Few of us know why he's doing it. And I'm really sure, and I'm almost always right about evil because I have a visceral reaction to evil. It's not that I'm the smartest girl in the room all the time. It's that my instincts are flawless. And I've learned to trust them. Especially, listen, I was in a room with Roger Ailes. Everybody knows that. I was in a, at a Fox uh, Christmas party, uh, you know, brought there by the head of iHeartRadio. And, uh, you know, uh, she, she said, oh, you know, just come with me and blah, blah, blah. And I've told the story about how, you know, uh, the, the, the Fox girls and they looked like they were spray painted and how it was just rife with sexual, uh, you know, uh, uh, like the Playboy Mansion is what it felt like. And uh, the only person that was nice to me in a weird, twisted way was what's his face uh, the guy that does straight news and speaks out on fox news now every once in a while from the guy from Te- shepherd smith yeah and he he recognized it and he said come over here hang out with us and i go and i said to him what is the deal with these girls they're maybe 19 years old what is it oh well, those are the fox girls i mean that was you know that was the nice guy and then roger ailes walked in and my skin crawled literally i i had to leave i have this visceral reaction to evil i have had it before I had it with Ailes. You know, I mean, I've told you. I had it with, um, during the, the, the um, Monica Lewinsky scandal when Linda Tripp was, uh, you know, uh, taking uh, uh, the, the advice from Lucianne Goldberg to record Monica Lewinsky's phone calls. A, a colleague of mine was doing an interview with Lucianne Goldberg and I literally threw up into the garbage can because he asked me, did I want to talk to her too? Did I want to join the interview? And I... I literally threw up because she was so evil. That's Jonah Goldberg's mother, Lucianne Goldberg. Vile woman. So I know what's going on. Bannon is playing the long game. His white supremacist movement must survive. He is more committed to this Nazi ideology than you might think. This has nothing to do with Donald Trump anymore. For Steve Bannon, it's about the movement. It's about the white supremacy. It's about the racism. It's about the isolationist. It's about the uber nationalist. It's about the party. And the party that he dreams of, the the Freedom Caucus and those crazy people, they're the Nazis in this. And he will preserve and protect every last one of them and destroy 
everyone else. The Randy Rhodes Air Force. The Randy Rhodes Show is live on RandyRhodes.com and the free Progressive Voices app for Android and iOS. Visit the App Store or ProgressiveVoices.com now. Now, the top of the hour on the Progressive Voices channel on TuneIn presents the Green News Report. The deep freeze even canceled many New Year's Eve celebrations from Boston to St. Louis and even as far south as Fort Worth, Texas. Record cold and bomb cyclone slams the eastern U.S. Clearly, uh, November and December have been disappointing. Drought grips California again. What happens in the melting Arctic doesn't stay in the melting Arctic. Plus, under cover of the holidays, Trump administration guts even more environment and safety regulations. All of that new year gutting and more straight ahead. From Bradblog.com, I'm Brad Friedman. And I'm Desi Doyan. Stand by for six minutes of independent green news, politics, analysis, and snarky comment. Because Donald Trump's cold right now, that's evidence that the earth is not getting warmer. Just like because Donald Trump is president right now, that's evidence we've never had a competent president. First green Trump slam of the year. This is your Green News Report. Okay, Desi Doyen, I usually don't know what's going on with the climate. Now I really don't know what's going on with the climate a bomb cyclone? Yeah, it's really getting wacky out there. We'll have more on that one in a moment. First, Tallahassee, Florida got extremely rare snowfall on Wednesday. Just one example of the extreme cold weather gripping the eastern half of the continental United States, linked to at least 17 deaths as we go to air. And now one of the most intense winter cyclones ever recorded. It's what meteorologists are calling a bomb cyclone because of its rapid intensification. It's slamming the east eastern seaboard from Georgia to Maine, bringing the potential for dangerous storm surge, high winds, and power outages. It's the equivalent of a Category 2 winter hurricane, fueled by heat energy from near record warm Atlantic Ocean temperatures. Remember, Warming Oceans, brought to you by Global Warming. Well, of course, Donald Trump says it's cold, so that means there is no global warming, and he probably thinks they just made up the word bomb cyclone. Yep, that record cold usually means an outbreak of phenomenally dumb comments and false claims that extreme cold events somehow refute all of climate science. But climate scientists have predicted for decades that global warming will bring more frequent extreme weather events. And many of these same regions, remember, just saw record-breaking heat waves just two months ago. And to put it all into perspective, the whole rest of the planet everything that is not the U.S. East Coast or Midwest, is actually warmer than usual right now. And while it may seem counterintuitive, scientists believe that these bitter cold events are connected to the warming of the Arctic, which is weakening the jet stream, sending frigid polar winds south to the lower U.S., like an open refrigerator door. Because what happens in the Arctic does not stay in the Arctic. Oh, well, lucky us. The extremes of 2018 are off to a strong start elsewhere. To escape the cold, you could head to Anchorage, Alaska, where it is actually warmer than the eastern U.S., and the state just had one of its warmest Decembers ever recorded. Yeah, I was looking at where my family lives in St. Louis, Missouri. It was like negative six a day or two ago. And then compared it to Anchorage, Alaska, it was like 25 degrees warmer. Meanwhile, California is grappling with extreme dryness. We're obviously hopeful that there'll be more snow the next time we come out here in the February, March, and April snowmelt surveys. The first official snowpack assessment of 2018 in California's Sierra Nevada mountain range on Wednesday measured just over one inch of snow. That's less than 3% of the average for this time of year. Less than 3%? Yeah, it's even worse. The entire U.S. Southwest has received only about 1% of its average rainfall since October. Oh, boy. Meanwhile, over the holidays, the Trump Interior Department rescinded Obama-era rules on fracking operations on the public's lands at the request of the oil and gas industry. Those rules would have reduced methane leaks, required the disclosure of fracking chemicals, and tightened standards for disposal of toxic wastewater. Environmental groups say they will challenge that repeal in court. 
The Trump administration also weakened safety rules on offshore drilling that were put in place to prevent a repeat of the disastrous 2010 BP oil spill, the worst in U.S. history. At the request of the oil industry, the Trump Interior Department weakened several safety regulations, including well control rules that were intended to prevent the type of blowout that killed 11 men and released more than 200 million gallons of crude oil into the Gulf of Mexico. And not only that, the Trump administration also halted a study in progress by the National Academies of Sciences intended to improve safety conditions for workers in offshore drilling operations. Finally, amid the Trump administration's rollback of safety regulations in the coal industry, fatalities in the coal mining industry after hitting a record low in 2016 nearly doubled in 2017 to the highest point in three years. Well, Donald Trump tried to take credit for the lack of commercial airplane disasters in 2017. Does he also get credit for the doubling of coal miner deaths in the same year? For much more on all of these stories and the ones we didn't get to today, please check out our website at greennews.bradblog.com. Find us, follow us, and share us worldwide on the Facebooks and the Twitters at Green News Report. I'm Brad Friedman. And I'm Desi Doyne. And this has been your Green News Report. You're as cold as ice. You're willing to sacrifice our love. Please help progressive voices support the Green News Report by stopping by bradblog.com slash donate. We believe that all men are created equal. To the magnificent mosaic that is America. A radio beacon to radio beacon. I have a dream today. Change has come to America. Believe it. Knock, knock. Who's there? Hey. It's a segment of your imagination. Randy Road Show. Turn up your mind. All right, so now I'm going to play you uh, some clips of... Uh, remember yesterday we were reading the Hollywood Reporter, uh, Michael Wolf article, where he was uh, describing Sam Nunberg, who was brought in to brief Donald Trump on things like the Constitution and uh, debate questions so that uh, uh, Donald Trump couldn't uh, be trapped by a gotcha question. And uh, his quote was that the president uh, got to the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution, started rolling his eyes and checked out and didn't really want to, you know, uh, be briefed any longer. And, uh, you know, it's a running theme in this uh, book that Donald Trump cares about absolutely nothing except Donald Trump and, uh, you know, getting instant gratification right now, whatever he wants, whenever he wants it, for whatever reason he wants it. And, uh, you know, being called Mr. Trump and being paid compliments. And I mean, the man is 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 easily manipulated by flattery. And that's what Steve Bannon knew. Uh, And that's why Steve Bannon partnered with him to bring forward this racist, uh, you know, uh, alt-right, whatever you want to call the Nazi agenda. But it's a Nazi agenda. There's no there's no question that this was to create uh, a, a unitary executive who was above the law, who could do whatever he wanted, that they could deport whoever they wanted, that they could ban people from coming into this country, isolate us in the world, uh, and, and rip off all the money. Just steal all the money, all the money, instead of watching the money uh, go to places like Pakistan, who are difficult partners, you know, but, uh, you know, let the money go there so that they don't align with China. Do things in the world to dissuade our, I won't call them allies, but our adversaries from going to even stronger adversaries of ours. That is why we do what we do in the world, is to keep an order where the United States is supreme and China is, uh, you know, second. Or where the United States is supreme and Russia is an also ran. Well, the leaders of Russia and China totally understand that this is their moment. And Trump is playing that game. Like I keep telling you, the foreign policy of the United States is Russia's foreign policy. This is not America's foreign policy. It is a foreign policy of an oligarchy. It is a foreign policy of a communist country called China. It is not an American foreign policy. And it will not keep us safe, and it will not uh, keep our, our, our alliances in the world strong. This is why at the very beginning, when Bannon first started talking through Trump, they were talking about things like getting rid of NATO. This was, you know, uh, Vladimir Putin's wildest dream, that we would abandon our allies and throw our adversaries into the loving arms of oil-rich nations that are also ran nations, like Russia, uh, and also China, to give them so much influence over... Listen, look where 
Pakistan is. If, if you were abandoned by the United States as Pakistan, where would you go to get military help? Right, you'd go to China. You'd go to India, even though they hate each other. They're realigning the world, making us weaker. This is a very sick, twisted plot. And the only person who's smart enough to think of it, let alone play the game, is Steve Bannon. So one of, his, uh, 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 one of the guys that was sent in to brief Donald Trump for the debates was Sam Nunberg. And he was per- quoted by Michael Wolff as saying the president was an idiot and uh, also saying, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, he had the attention span of a flea and all this stuff. Right. So Sam, Num- Sam Nunberg was interviewed uh, by the ABC News briefing room team uh, and uh one of the questions that, that they were asked was, why is Bannon doing this? Okay, this is like the big question, right? I answered it for you. Bannon is doing this because Bannon knows Donald Trump is guilty, Ivanka is guilty, Jared is guilty of money laundering. He knows that Manafort is guilty. He knows that Flynn is guilty. He knows that Gates is guilty. He knows that Roger Stone is guilty. He knows that Papadopoulos pled guilty to lying to the FBI um, and that, uh, you know, deals are being made. And Donald Trump is going down because he knows about the uh, uh, the conspiracy. He, it's not collusion. It's conspiracy. It's This is RICO Act stuff. And Donald Trump knows it, too. So Bannon is protecting this white supremacist movement that he's got that he feels very, very uh, strongly about. And he knows that when Trump goes down and Manafort goes down and Flynn goes down and Ivanka goes down and Jared goes down, that there is going to be a break between the people who voted for Donald Trump in the Make America Great Again movement and the Make America Great Again movement. They're going to give up on it because they're going to find out it was all a, a, a con. So Bannon is protecting it. All right. So in the ABC briefing room, there's a girl who apparently knows uh, uh, Bannon really well and knows Sam Nunberg really well. And they interviewed Sam Nunberg. And she asked him, why is Bannon doing this? It's an interesting answer that Nunberg gives. I want you to like really listen to it because he's going to tell you exactly what I told you, but in his way. Because he is one of these Make America Great Again people, okay? He likes the idea that Don McGahn, this crooked lawyer in the White House, is nominating, you know, people who are, um, you know, I told you, the, the, the guys, the three judges that didn't make it, that were even, like, so reprehensible that, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, Orrin Hatch couldn't do it, and, 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 and Senator Kennedy from Louisiana said uh, no. Remember, it was uh, Brett Talley from Alabama who was writing for a KKK website. Jeff Mateer from Texas who said that transgender children were clearly uh, uh, evidence that Satan was winning. Uh, and uh, then you, you also have Brett Talley was ma- is married to Don McGahn's chief of staff member and didn't disclose that. And Jeff Mateer was picked by Ted Cruz. You remember these guys? Okay, so I want you to know that Sam Nunberg is a supporter of these kinds of judges. He's a supporter of people who write for KKK websites. And he's supportive of uh, Don McGahn's cronies being put into uh, judgeships. So, but it's such an interesting answer that he gave to what is Bannon doing. What do you think Steve was thinking when he said some of these highly unflattering things about the president and his family, specifically the comment about treason? Well, first of all, I do want to say, uh, on, uh, I do want to also get something out. I'm not here as a special pleader for Steve on that comment. I fundamentally disagree with him, one, that that meeting was treasonous. I would tell you I would have taken that meeting. But let me also be sure that Bob Mueller understands I had nothing to do with the campaign at that point. In fact, I was sued a couple weeks later. I don't want to be called in. Uh, oh, and if there was nothing wrong with the meeting that Steve Bannon called treasonous, you know, which he never would have done, except that uh, he needs to preserve the Make America Great Again movement, right? Uh, then why did you have to put a disclaimer out there right away? Uh, Robert Mueller, I just want you to know, I wasn't with the campaign when uh, Don Jr. had the meeting with the road. I just want you to know. For a deposition um, or the grand jury. Yeah. But I also fundamentally disagree with the way that he talked about the Trump organization. Uh, Rick and Tara, I'm not here to defend the business practices of the Kushner companies. In fact, I think that there could be some problems and legal problems with those. What I will tell you is in my limited, limited dealings or what my observations when I was around the president or his or the people that worked for him at Trump organization, they abided by the top 
of the law, by the letter of the law. Mm-hmm. For instance, when they had the issue in Chicago with the sign, a sign. Where Rahm Emanuel wanted him to remove that big Trump sign that was, that was in the Chicago hotel. He had the proper zoning. Um, Ooh. And I just think that the way they talked about. So, you know, he had proper zoning. Therefore, he could not possibly be, uh, you know, conspiring with the Russians. No, because he had the proper zoning. Uh, the, the way Steve talked about money laundering and about Don Jr. That was wholly inappropriate. I think that the president would not have commented or done anything about the book, except the fact that Steve comes out there attacking Don and attacking his, who's his son and attacking the organization. Look, you can attack Jared Kushner. Frankly, you could probably even attack Ivanka. Because they're in the arena. They're in the White House. He didn't ask them. You know, they've they've asked for this. But to attack his son like that, I think, was really, really wrong, personally. Hey, Sam, it's uh, Ben Siegel. I'm here with Rick and Tara. Would you mind elaborating on what you just said about legal problems with with the Kushner companies uh, in terms of what your your thoughts are on that? Well, I mean, mean, look, (laughs) here's the history. I mean, here's the history of that. Um, One of the reasons Chris Christie sent Jared's father... Uh, prosecuted Jared's father was for a tax issue. And look, I just read the public reports. You have this 666 Fifth Avenue. Jared buys it. It's probably one of the worst real estate deals in the history of real estate for like $1.5, $1.8 billion. Buys it at the top of the market. We then have the financial crisis. And this has been reported. I, I only trust what I read in the New York Times. Jared, during the transition, went to the Waldorf Astoria, met with a Chinese businessman, the head of Enbang, who, by the way, has disappeared now in China, so that could show you how smart that meeting was. And he tried to get funding for 666. You also have what the Washington Post reported with Deutsche Bank uh, giving that massive loan uh, to to the Kushner company in October. I think that those are issues. Now, on the other hand, here's a separate issue. Is that something that Michael Weissman should be looking at, who's a member of Robert Mueller's team? Does that necessarily involve Russia, uh, Russia being involved in the election? I'm, I don't know. I don't think so. Perhaps it's out of the mandate. But, I, but, I mean, that is an issue. Whoops. Okay, so there goes Jared. There goes Ivanka. Bye-bye. Right, bye-bye, right? Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. It's a good list. That's so funny. It's only funny to the rabbi who knows us. Jared and Ivanka's rabbi knows us very, very, very well. Right, rabbi? Mm -hmm. So Jared is in trouble, obviously. Uh, Ivanka is in trouble. If you have somebody from inside the Trump world, inside Trump world, throwing Jared out to the wolves and saying, you could attack Ivanka, you could attack Jared. Because, you know, they did illegal things. You see, this is all, this is, this is Donald Trump being Donald Trump. Donald Trump believes in a one-way street. You protect Donald Trump, period, end of story. He doesn't protect you. Not even if you're his daughter or his son-in-law or anybody. It's all about this man. It's all about him. This is so freaky. And it's so obvious what's going on. This is Bannon not wanting to go down with the Ivankas, with the Jareds, with the Juniors, with the Manaforts, with the Gates, with the Flynns, with the Roger Stones, with the Carter Pages, with the Papadopoulos's, with the Je- Jeff Sessions is going too, because Jeff's at, and probably Pence, because they lied. They lied to Congress. They've lied. Now, think about this. Pence knows all of this. Says nothing. This is quite a predicament we got ourselves in. But, you know, I feel good that it's 2018. I just feel good because 18 is, is high, right, Rabbi? It means life. I'm so pissed off at that rabbi. I am so angry at him. But anyway, they're all going. They're all going. That's, that's the beauty. Randy Rhodes, Air Force. The Randy Rhodes Show is live on RandyRhodes.com and the free Progressive Voices app for Android and iOS. Visit the App Store or ProgressiveVoices.com now. Smoke them if you got them. 
Yes, it's Herky Jerky in 2018. And for 2018, they're starting off with $5 off full packs of delicious beef smokies. Since Herky Jerky started in 1992, Herky Jerky's delicious beef smokies have been one of the most popular items and for very good reason. The 100% beef meat sticks have just the right amount of snap on the outside and flavor on the inside. They're low cholesterol, high protein, guaranteed fresh, and the perfect snack for any occasion. This month, they're ringing in the new year with a discount of $5 off all full packs of their three kinds of Smokies, mild honey and jalapeno. The full packs are one and a half pounds. They include 30 long sticks. The discount applies to full packs only, but as always, if you buy any two packs of their products, you'll get free shipping. We hope everybody had a fun and safe holiday season, and we look forward to you enjoying Herky Jerky in 2018 with the absolute best and most delicious jerky anywhere in the world. Visit HerkyJerky.com now. Again, HerkyJerky.com. Enter promo code SMOKY. Hello, Progressive Voices Tune In listeners. I'm Casey Hobbs. And I'm Shane Mason, and we're the hosts of Nurse Talk Radio. Here's what we're talking about this week. Just explain to me for a minute. So the reports must show that there is great harm to the community, yes. both in the land and in people's health. It's showing that in communities where this particular kind of gas extraction is happening, people have headaches and animals have been sick and kids are having nosebleeds and a wide array of other signs and symptoms. But the other thing that we need to note is that these chronic exposures are probably teeing them up for longer term chronic diseases and, uh, you know, perhaps diseases that we're going to see later on. Unfortunately, then the people will be far into their illnesses and it'll be harder for them to get any good health care as a result of years of that. Amanda Krantz is the founder and CEO of Doja.com, a website connecting patients and caregivers for the sole purpose of sharing gratitude. You know, the person you want to thank may not be coming in for the next couple of shifts. Now, if you leave a paper card or leave cookies, you don't know if it got to the person that you wanted so to So true, thank. and oftentimes it doesn't, yeah. Yeah, so now we wrote pre-written responses. Thank you so much for your kind words. It means the most to me. And patients can attach photos as well. And so, you know, it was great to see how well you're doing now. Yeah. Those things mean so much to the patient, and it's still no hip a violation. Get on in 90 seconds, share your gratitude, be done. You might not think of thanking them until years later. I've been in nursing a long time and when I was 25, taking care of a gentleman who had had a heart attack and on the fourth day I walk into his room and he says, I wanted to thank you. Mm -hmm. I got you flowers because you really turned around my thinking about male nurses. And I am standing there wearing earrings and I said, thank you so much. I appreciate yeah. it. <laughs> Check out our show at nursetalksite.com and listen every Saturday and Sunday right here on Progressive Voices. Call in, connect. To speak to Randy, call 561-270-3844. 561-270-3844. All right, here is Sam Nunberg, uh, not denying that he called the president an idiot. I'm not disputing what he writes uh, in the totality. I'm just trying to give it a little more, uh, a little more, uh, I, I would say, color. So the circumstances I describe. I haven't seen, by the way, today, I, where, where was it written that I called him an idiot? That's in the book. We, we, the ABC News has obtained a copy, and that, that was a, a quote that's uh, actually from the book. Uh, the, the, one okay. of the quotes is, the, the, this is what your quote is saying, is Trump a good person, an intelligent person, a capable person? I don't even know, but I know he's a star. Uh, another quote uh, was referring to Steve Bannon. Uh, I believe it was, if you, if, if you get this idiot elected twice, uh, you'd go down in history. Oh, sure. So I may have said that as a joke. I don't believe okay. the president. Look, I think Tara knows me very well, Rick. I haven't spent <laughs> that much time with you. But uh, I'm from New York, and I'm very sarcastic. I would tell you he's not. I certainly probably said that, but he's by no means an idiot at all. So, well, and, Mike, uh, once again, is accurate. I may have used that word, yes. I may have used that word for the president of the United States that he's an idiot. Uh, but it's just because I'm from New York over here, you see? Now, Ivanka and Jared, they also pick Scaramucci. I mean, this whole thing is a mess. The people that they pick, the guy who's in charge of the media operation, Dan Scavino, is the caddy. for. He's a golf caddy. I mean, this whole thing is going to uh, flame out. And and I got, I got news for you. There is another big, big, huge blockbuster story that came out last night in the New York Times, courtesy of Michael Schmidt. 
uh, with a live assist from Maggie Haberman. These are some of the best newspaper people I have seen in forever, okay? And uh, one of the reporters who contributed to this uh, uh, blockbuster story that Trump wanted to be protected by his attorney general, that he was looking for, you know, like a shyster lawyer, like a mob lawyer. Uh, when he hired Jeff Sessions, he thought Jeff Sessions uh, was going to be like his Roy Cohen. Uh, mean, you know, Roy Cohn was uh, the, the the attorney for Donald Trump for years and years. But before that, he was the attorney for uh, uh, McCarthy, the senator from uh, Wisconsin who had the, the communist, you know, there was a communist under everybody's uh, pillow. There was a communist under every bed. There was a communist in every class. Lucy, uh, you know, Lucy, uh, uh, Lucille Ball was a communist, you know, and started a blacklist in Hollywood and people couldn't work because of this uh, crazy fear of the red menace. You know, I mean, it's just unbelievable. And so... Um, they got uh, they got some reporting that said that uh, Jeff Sessions. Now you, we all know that the president was furious that Jeff Sessions recused himself in the Russia inquiry, and of course Jeff Sessions had to recuse himself in the Russia inquiry because Jeff Sessions was part of the campaign that was being investigated to find out if there was a conspiracy with the campaign to allow Russia to hack our elections and then use the stolen information to their benefit. And our intelligence community had concluded that that was true and everybody got briefed on it before they took office and knew that the intelligence community had come to the conclusion that uh, the Russians did have a preferred uh, winner in this and that it was going to be Donald Trump and it was really anybody but uh, Hillary. And so, of course, Jeff Sessions had had conversations with Kislyak that he lied to Congress about at the beginning. Uh, and it turned out not only did he have, you know, chance meetings at the Mayflower Hotel and all this crap, but he had Kislyak in his office privately and so Jeff Sessions was under investigation and he had to recuse himself so it turns out that the New York Times found that um, Jeff Sessions uh, was lobbied by the the White House counsel Don McGahn not to recuse himself and that deputy uh, you know, low level uh, career employees were assigned the task of telling uh, Jeff Sessions why he didn't have to recuse himself and that Don McGahn was sent to lobby firmly and to tell Jeff Sessions he is not to recuse himself, that he is to protect the president. Now, the attorney general of the United States is the United States attorney. He is not Donald Trump's attorney. You understand White House counsel is also not the president's attorney. White House counsel is there to protect the office of the presidency, not the occupant of the office. If you want protection as an occupant of the office, then you go out and hire an attorney like Bill Clinton did when he had to defend himself against Ken Starr. He had to have personal attorneys conduct his deposition. Hillary Clinton had to go and testify in front of the grand jury, which she did. Bill Clinton had to testify in front of the grand jury. His lawyer negotiated an appearance on tape. He didn't want to go to the grand jury as the president of the United States, but he did have to give testimony to the grand jury, and this president will too. And it won't be Don McGahn representing the president. It will be Ty Cobb or one of those, or, or, or what's his other, the, the, the other one that lies all day long on the TV? Who? From New York. From the, yeah, him. No, not Kasowitz. Kasowitz is out. He's been out a long time. That lying sack of crap that's always on the TV. Sekolo, Jay Sekolo, that's it. Thank you, Scotty. So, I mean, you know, this is what you do. You know, you the, the White House counsel is not there as your personal counsel. The White House counsel is there to protect the office of the presidency. He's supposed to tell the president when the president asks for or orders or talks to somebody in a way that is a violative of the law as the president of the United States, then the, the White House counsel is supposed to intervene. He is not representing the man in the office. He's representing the office. Same thing with the attorney general. The, the, the attorney general and the FBI, these are apolitical. This is why we are a nation of laws, not a nation of men. If we were a nation of men, then Donald Trump would have the attorney general at his disposal. He doesn't. He doesn't. So what they uncovered last night, the New York Times, was that the White House counsel was acting on behalf of Donald Trump's orders to go and tell Jeff Sessions, order him not to recuse himself, that the president wanted to be personally protected by the attorney general with regard to the Russia probe. And this is the clearest 
evidence we have seen of corrupt intent. Now, in order to make an obstruction case, you don't have to have completed the obstruction. There is a, a, a section of uh, U.S. Code 18, okay, that says that endeavoring to obstruct justice is also a crime. But in order to prove that crime, you don't have to prove that he actually did obstruct justice. You have to prove that he endeavored with corrupt intent. And that is why this story is so important. It talks about how Trump gave firm instructions in March to the Attorney General Jeff Sessions that he cannot recuse himself from the Justice Department's investigation into whether or not Trump conspired with the Russians. And that he then, President Trump then dispatched Don McGahn, the White House counsel, to carry out his orders and to go and lobby Jeff Sessions to stay. And that even further steps were taken. Even further steps were taken. The other steps that were taken were that they hired, uh, that, that they brought in a low level guy who they could, you know, denounce and say he was just a coffee boy to write an opinion saying that Jeff Sessions did not have to recuse himself until the investigation was further along. And. That he did not, that Jeff Sessions didn't have to disclose anything about anything that was going on in the investigation. Uh, okay, so I, I'm, t and so uh, there are other, and so these things, according to the New York Times, these things are known to Robert Mueller. The other part of the story is even more hair raising. It says that somebody in Jeff Sessions' office, a close aide to Jeff Sessions, went to Capitol Hill and talked to senators and House members, asking them if they had any dirt on James Comey because the president was going to fire James Comey. The decision was made because, just like he told Lester Holt, the decision was made to fire Comey over the Russia thing. The Russia thing, which is what he told us. Oh, remember I said that tape was kryptonite? That was it. That was a, a moment in time that's catching lightning in a bottle if you're a prosecutor, okay? That's idiot boy Trump goes on the TV and says that. And so this report confirms that the decision to fire Comey had been made before Rod Rosenstein wrote his memo, uh, before, you know, uh, 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 Jeff Session. It, it, it was already made. And so then, in search of dirt on Comey to support the decision to fire Comey, to end the Russia investigation, which is obstruction of justice with corrupt intent, okay, that an aide to Jeff Sessions did go to Capitol Hill four days before Comey was fired to dig up dirt on Comey. Now, I want to play you, I'll play you uh, some audio. This is Maggie Haberman calling in uh, to CNN last night with this breaking news story. But the, the audio isn't great. And so uh, I wanted to tell you ahead of playing the clip what she's saying, okay? Um, you're going to hear uh, Anderson Cooper say, do we know on whose behest he did that when, it, when it, she's talking about an aide, uh, a Jeff Sessions aide going to Capitol Hill to dig up dirt on Comey four days before he was fired? She says we don't. But it was somebody working for Jeff Sessions. It's not clear whether Sessions directly knew or didn't directly know, but it came up in the Department of Justice. And then Anderson Cooper is going to ask her if the White House counsel, Don McGahn, was acting on behalf of orders from President Trump. And you will hear Maggie Haberman say, correct. The president wanted to be personally protected by the attorney general with regard to the Russia probe. Now, this, as I said, is the clearest evidence of corrupt intent that we have uh, with regard to ending, uh, you know, to obstructing the Russia investigation. OK, so here is the little tape here. That new report in The New York Times, the headline obstruction inquiry shows Trump's struggle to keep grip on Russia investigation. One of the reporters, or Maggie Haberman, joins us now on the phone. Maggie, explain what, uh, what, what you have learned. What's in this? 
Sure. This is. I would like to just be clear. This is primarily Mike Schmidt, my colleague's reporting, um, and and he did a terrific job. He came up with uh, very detailed reporting about how Don McGahn, uh, the White House counsel, went at the urging of the president to the attorney general uh, and asked him not to recuse from the Russia probe, which, as we know, Jeff Sessions did without telling the president he was going to do it in advance. Made the president very angry. He's been angry about it ever since. It has set off a chain reaction ever since. Um, the uh, uh, the idea that uh, McGahn would go do this uh, knowing that this was potentially problematic is striking. When the president was told that uh, Sessions was still going to recuse himself, um, the president was very angry, um, fumed that he needed to be personally protected, uh, wanted some kind of a relationship between himself and the AG, uh, the way he believed that uh, Bobby Kennedy had protected John F. Kennedy. This is how he uh, cited it. Uh, Mike also learned that four days before James Comey was fired, an aide to Jeff Sessions went to Capitol Hill looking for quote unquote dirt on Comey. Ah. Um, the timing is quite notable. Wait a minute. I just want you to repeat that. Uh, four days before Comey was fired, an aide mm-hmm. of, of Sessions? Yes, looking for dirt, quote unquote. Went to Capitol Hill looking for negative information about James Comey. Oh my God. Do we know at whose behest that person did that? It, we don't, but it was somebody working for Jeff Sessions. Uh, you know, I, it's not clear to me whether Sessions directly knew or didn't directly know, but it was certainly coming from uh, the Department of Justice. And just to be clear, you said uh, talked about Don McCann going to try to convince Jeff Sessions not to recuse himself. He was doing that, according to this reporting, at the order of President Trump. Correct. The president wanted to be personally protected by the attorney general uh, with regard to the Russia probe. This is about as this is the the clearest most um, substantial reporting we have seen about what the president demanded uh, and what he wanted of the attorney general with regard to this probe. Oh, my God. That is what Mueller is investigating. And there's other things that Mueller is investigating. Um, You know, Trump keeps describing the Russia investigation as fabricated and politically motivated. But there is a letter that was supposed to be sent to the FBI director. It was supposed to be sent to James Comey. Uh, that, uh, the, but the White House stopped him. This is where I think Don McGahn uh, realized that he was culpable in uh, the looking for dirt on Comey and that he was culpable in uh, lobbying Jeff Sessions not to recuse himself on behalf of the president's orders. Uh, and, 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 and McGahn stopped Donald Trump from sending a letter to Robert Mueller that substantiated the claims that James Comey made when he testified and that James Comey made in these memos that described these interactions with the president before he was fired. And it it looks as if the first line of the letter that Donald Trump wanted to send uh, was a false statement Right. Uh, That that he was going to say that, uh, you know, he had dirt on James Comey and that James Comey was, uh, you know, a nut job and all that. And they wouldn't send. This is all coming to a head. This is what Steve Bannon knows. So when everybody is sitting there scratching their heads and other various body parts going, what is Steve Bannon up to? I mean, he's just committed suicide. No, 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 no. The president of the United States is going down this year. He is going down. Ivanka and Jared and Stone, and Manafort, and Flynn, they're all going to make their deals. And the only reason why Mueller would make a deal with any of them is to get to the truth that is the mess known as Donald Trump. And the idea that this guy, Nunberg, mentions Deutsche Bank? Oh, my God. See, everybody knows, and this is the point that we started with, The point that we started with was I was going to explain to you what I believe Bannon is protecting, okay? But also I said to you that it is so obvious to me, it is so evident to me that this president is done, that he's cooked, and everybody is like the – but everyone knows it. Everyone has – this is the open secret in Washington. This is what they all know, that the president is not fit. He never has been. But that they put – like I said, the Republicans in Congress, they just wanted this tax cut, okay? That's what Mitch McConnell wanted. He wanted this freaking tax cut. That's what they all wanted. That's what Ryan wanted. And they all know this. They know everything that I'm telling you, and they always have known it. You know, when you you put together a little montage, as Scotty did, of – 
the Republicans then saying what they said about Donald Trump being a bully and and and, and, and self motivated and you know unfit and wackadoodle and, and, and Lindsey Graham and Paul Ryan and, and, and all of them knew, and they said so when they didn't think he was going to be president, and now that he's president. They know that he will sign anything they put in front of him. And this is the silver lining for them of betraying their own country's safety and security. Here, listen to this. This is then and now. It's time to set aside uh, bullying, uh, to set aside belittlement and appeal to higher aspirations. Something this profound could not have been done without exquisite presidential leadership. Our new president had, of course, not been in this line of work before and I think had excessive expectations about how quickly things happen. This has been a year of extraordinary accomplishment (laughs) for the Trump administration. Thank you, Mr. President, for all you're doing. Fight me. The president uh, has great difficulty with the truth on many issues. What you said in October, if you still believe that. Look, you know, uh, I know you're having a great time with this interview. And uh, I'm happy for you in doing so. Uh, But look, Wolf, uh, I've said what I've said, um, and I'm doing what I'm doing. I think he's a kook. I think he's crazy. I think he's unfit for office. You know what concerns me about the American press is this endless, endless attempt to label the guy as some kind of kook, uh, not fit to be president. Uh, it wasn't the media that labeled him a kook and not fit to be. It was you, Lindsay. It was you. Bob Corker is the one who said that he's not fit to be president, that he's like a, you know, a, a child and that he's unhinged. Paul Ryan is the one who called him a bully and now says, oh, he's an exquisite man, you know, and I just, uh, you know, I, I just uh, want to worship at the hem of his garment. I mean, the silver lining of selling out your country for the Republican Party is money. That is sad and sick, but it's true. And so I just want you to know that when we get rid of Trump and Pence and Corker leaves and Flake leaves and all these people who criticize the president leave, it's leaving open Steve Bannon's white supremacist agenda. To speak to Randy, call now, you bastards. 561-270-3844. Hello, hello. With Randy Rhodes, Randy Rhodes, Air Force. Whether you're listening to me, Mark Levine, each Monday and Wednesday, or me, Leslie Marshall, each Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, you can hear us 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern Time on the Progressive Voices Network. Here's a sample of what you'll hear. 2017 is hopefully, if not the beginning of the end, the end of the beginning of Donald Trump. This is a test of America. And hopefully, like that little piece of smallpox that they put in to immunize you to the great disease, hopefully this will be a wake-up call. The fight to protect our press, in the fight to protect our immigrants, Native Americans and African Americans, LGBT people and, and Jews and women and anyone this guy attacks, frankly, the tie to protect the middle class to protect poor people, to protect innocent Americans who are just trying to live their lives, that we will immunize ourselves and make us stronger. And for better and for worse, this was a year all about Donald Trump. Actually, I think I should say for worse and for even worse, it was a year about Donald Trump. From our trepidations, our fear at the beginning of the year of what would happen once he became president on January 20th, to our incredible astonishment at how awful a president he was. Uh, The tweets alone showed a man who is not only incapable of understanding public policy. He has no interest in it. He just makes up stuff as he goes along, and most of it is false. It really showed a little bit about who our country is. I think the Trump administration in 2017 reminds me of those disaster movies. You know the ones. Things start out where things are okay, but you fear something really bad is going to happen, and then really bad things do happen and it gets worse and worse and worse and then just when you think it'll be okay it gets even worse 
But then as the movies end, somehow the heroes regroup and find a way out of the darkness, find a way to stop whatever fire or intense hurricane or horrible disaster, maybe it's Godzilla, is wrecking the village and they come together and they count their dead and they hug each other and they realize after beating the monster, they will live to see a better tomorrow. One of the biggest stories is activism. That culminated, yes, in the Virginia and Alabama elections, but began the day after inauguration. The whole world was telling Donald Trump, we don't accept your vision of hatred and fear. And that activism is definitely what brought us to to the great uh, elections at the end of 2017. And frankly, I think it's going to propel us on to 2018. I think the lessons of 2017 were we were complacent in 2016. We didn't think this terrible thing could happen. And now we know it can, and it does, and we're ready to fight it. Again, that's Mark Levine every Monday and Wednesday. And Leslie Marshall each Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern Time on the Progressive Voices Network. This is the Randy Rhodes Show. To speak with Randy, dial 561-270-3844. That's 561-270-3844. Okay, you remember the day that Walter Schaub uh, walked out and, and you know, left, uh, left, left the uh, government, uh, the Office of Government Ethics? It was a big day because, uh, you know, he, he was trying to send a signal to you uh, that this was one of the most unethical presidencies he'd ever experienced. And uh, we were talking that day to Richard Painter, who uh, also is, um, you know, uh, an ethics uh, expert. He was, you know, for two years, uh, this is kind of an oxymoron, and he agrees uh, that he was George Bush's ethics advisor uh, for a couple of years. But anyway, Walter Schaub was interviewed last night, and uh, he was asked about this order uh, that Don McGahn was given to stop Sessions from recusing himself. And Walter Schaub has the most amazing story. He is telling the story here uh, to CNN that he was on the phone. He was on the phone trying to tell De- Jeff Sessions he had to recuse himself when Don McGahn walked into Jeff Sessions' office and told him that he didn't have to recuse himself. And this is what he said. While I was on the phone talking to Department of Justice officials, telling them that Jeff Sessions had no choice but to recuse in order to resolve a criminal conflict of interest, mm. we now learn that Don McGahn was pressuring Jeff Sessions on behalf of the president to do just the opposite, participate in in that investigation. That you know, he can try to hide behind the I was only following orders, but that didn't work at Nuremberg. Oh my and God. it's not gonna work here because as an attorney, the president is not his client. The office of the president is is his client, and he's ultimately answerable to the American people. This is just I don't have words I can use on TV this morning to describe how angry I am to learn this. Walter, I mean, you're using very strong words. I mean, to say that, to liken it to Nuremberg, you're saying that you think that Don McGahn, the chief uh, attorney for the White House, is the president's puppet? Yeah, and I don't mean to liken it to Nuremberg. I just meant that that excuse didn't work, and we've established that. Um, here's the thing. It is a crime for a federal employee to participate in a particular matter in which he has a financial interest. An investigation is a particular matter. A subject of an investigation has a financial interest in that investigation. And Jeff Sessions was a member of the Trump campaign who spoke with Russian officials in 2016 in one capacity or another and did not reveal that in his congressional testimony under oath. Mm. So he was certainly a potential subject of any investigation into the Trump campaign's communications with Russian officials, and he knew that, which is why he did do the right thing and uh, recuse. Um, I have to say, and I I can't talk details about individuals or time because I'm limiting myself to what's already publicly known, Hmm. and I had revealed while I was director of OGE that I gave this advice to DOJ, uh, but I can share that I felt the DOJ officials seemed uncharacteristically rattled when I was talking to them, and I couldn't figure out why. I thought, well, maybe Jeff Sessions has a hot temper that I don't know about, but it turns out Don McGahn, who is known to have a hot temper, was leaning on them to recuse, and that, to me, fills in the missing piece of the puzzle as to why they seemed a little rattled when I was talking to them. Do you think this is obstruction of justice? 
I think that we are in a neighborhood where I hope Mueller is looking at this very seriously for obstruction of justice because it could be. I don't like to say for sure that a crime has been committed because we don't know all the facts yet, but at this point it would be irresponsible not to look into it. And members of Congress, the few of them uh, who are actively trying to undermine the Mueller investigation, really need to back off if they care at all about their country. Yeah, but unfortunately they don't. They don't. You have people who are calling for Sessions to resign now so that the president can appoint whoever he wants temporarily to fire Mueller. That is where we are. The president is all boxed in. So we can add Jeff Sessions to the, you know, to the, the rabbi's good list. It's a very good list, rabbi. Uh, right, we can add, we can add this uh, Sessions to uh, Ivanka, Jr., Jared, Manafort, Gates, Flynn, Roger Stone, Papadopoulos, Jeff Sessions, all either making deals or going to jail. And again, the only reason why Mueller would make a deal with any of these people is to get to the truth about the mess that is Donald Trump. So, good list, Rabbi. You, you really picked the right crowd. Yeah, where's Eric? He's in the, he's in the winery. Uh, Tony in Atlanta. Hey, Randy. Hey. Damn. Yeah. You are on fire today. Well, you know, it's it's just the facts. It's That's all it is. I, I mean, I, I have chills right now because, I mean, you got me through the Bush administration, and now that thing that the dude that just said before, the, the, um, uh, the ethics lawyer for the government. Yeah. Walter Schaub. I, I, I don't. Oh my God! I don't even know where to put that. Yeah, it's it's I, I mean, it's bizarre. This is well, we knew it was going to be bizarre. Uh, I, I had no earthly idea that it was going to be uh, a conspiracy uh, to allow Russia to take over our foreign policy uh, or or our country, for that matter. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've been I've been listening to you for years because um, you. Listening to just the facts is so painful. Yeah, it is. That, yeah, but you make me laugh. And I've been laughing for since the 90s when you were on Air America, but this ain't funny no more. No, it's deadly serious is what it is, uh, you know, and uh, the, 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 just the bizarre quality of it is, is almost laughable. I wish it were behind us so we could laugh at it. Yeah. But, uh, okay, the question I wanted to ask was, um, uh, uh, now, when you listen to people on the, on the radio, like uh, Richard Painter, uh, <laughs> Richard Painter says uh, that there's going to be a I said, I said, I said, son, you look like 10 miles of bad road. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. He I love him. I love Richard I Painter. Love he dude. sounds no, no. exactly the way you want him to sound when he's saying the things that he needs to say. He's just, uh, you know. I said, right. I said, I said, dog, why do you do me like you do, do, do? <laughs> but here's the thing, though. Okay, okay. I'm trying not to get sidetracked because I'm still hurt by the ethics guy. Mm -hmm. But um, <laughs> if there is a constitutional crisis, right. they keep saying there's going to be a constitutional crisis. Right. Donald Trump doesn't know what the Constitution is. No. Never mind a constitutional crisis. So Donald is going to be Donald. What happens if there is a constitutional crisis? Well, they'll remove him. They will vote to remove him. Who? The Republicans? Yeah. They will have no really? choice. Listen, remember, Are there's only two things Republicans care about. There's only two things they care about. Money and more money. Okay, that's it. And so the money well, yeah. in the first place is for re-election. And the money in the second place is so that they can, you know, profit off of, uh, you know, whatever it is that they're doing. So, you know, like these people of great conscience, the Jeff Flakes and the Corkers and all, they're going straight to lobby shops to make real money. You understand that, right? And they see that yeah. this is all falling apart and they don't want to be caught up in it. So they're cashing out. Okay. Now, the Freedom Caucus crazies, uh, they're a little bit different. They care about white supremacy more than, uh, you know, most but money is still everything to them. So, yes, when they see that the white supremacist banner can still survive without Trump, they will remove him. 
And oh that's what, and that's what Bannon is doing. Bannon is separating himself from Donald Trump to preserve this uh, Freedom Caucus, Make America Great, Nazi, white supremacist, alt-right, whatever you want, the peppy movement, okay? Peppy! That is what he is, uh, he's <laughs> doing. He's just getting out ahead of it because he's smarter than Donald Trump. That's it. That's yeah, all I that's mean, happening. He's right. No. Okay, he's going he's gonna to be proven right. Right. So their side that's right. Get, and that gives their gonna, side credibility, doesn't it? And that's why he's playing this long game because. Uh, right. And, it, and like I said, when all these people are removed and they will be. OK, there will still be the alt right. There will still be this white supremacist movement. Now, I will tell you, the Mercer family, who's probably in the crosshairs of Mueller, too, for receiving some of the hacked uh, data, uh, you know, on the voters that was stolen. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Yeah, they're they're I'm now sorry. publicly <laughs> right. They're now publicly denouncing Steve Bannon. So here's what you watch for after the removal of Trump. Okay, because I'm always okay. like a year ahead of everybody else. What you watch I for? Know, I, I know, I know, so awesome. it's, I know, I am awesome. But he, but here, <laughs> but here's what you watch for. Okay, after the after the whole Trump thing is done and Sessions is gone and all these people got in Ivanka and Jared made their deals, whatever. Then you want to watch for the reemergence of the Bannon movement and the Mercer money. Because right now they're saying, OK, we're cutting Steve Bannon off. Meanwhile, in October, they hosted a party for Steve Bannon. They love Steve Bannon. Steve Bannon is their guy. So now they're distancing themselves from Bannon while it gets very hot under Bannon's collar as he distances himself from Trump. And uh, as soon as Trump's gone, Bannon's Make America Great crap is going to have credibility because he says, see, I told you Donald was bad. I told you he wasn't the right guy for us, but we're going to keep going. And the Mercers will come strategy. back. Yeah, of course, it's a strategy. It's a long game is what it is. Wow. Mitch McConnell plays a long game, okay? Bannon plays a long game. Donald Trump is into instant gratification. This is why that fact is so important. It's so important to know that you have a president that doesn't play the long game. China plays the long game. Russia plays the long game, okay? Uh, Bannon's playing the long game. Uh, McConnell plays the long game. This president is an idiot. He plays for the hamburger tonight at 5 o'clock. Oh, he's wimpy. Well, he's a loser is what he is. He's a guy who failed upward and failed with other people's money. It's what he is. He's a con man. He's a, That's why Mitt Romney said he was a fraud. Mitt freaking Romney said he was a fraud. And now Mitt Romney's oh, going to run scary. for the Senate, right? All right. Do you think he'll get in? Yeah. Oh, of course. It's Utah. Yes, he'll get in. And then he'll run for president right. again. It's not done. This is going to be a cycle. It's just going to you know, repeat itself. Man, but oh, that is I why I stand it. on the wall. And I would appreciate it if the white supremacists in this country didn't question the manner in which I protect them. Oh my God, I love you so much. Your movie quotes are freaking <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Have a good weekend. Thank you. Uh, Vicki in Pismo Beach. Hi, Randy. Hey. How are you? Good. How are you? I, I'm hanging in there good. like everybody else, I wondering hear what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, next week, he is due for a physical, mm -hmm. this physical. Ooh. Does he get to choose uh, a doctor? Or yeah, of is, course. Oh, he can choose a doctor. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, what about the psychological uh, part of it? I don't think they the will. I mean, everybody wants that to happen. I don't know that that will happen. And then, of course, he's got control over his own medical records because of the HIPAA Act privacy, right? And so... He's going to, you know, like Obama, we knew his systolic pressure. We knew his, you know, uh, you know, whether or not he had good urine flow. We had we knew everything about him uh, because he released it. But Donald Trump will have control over whatever the findings are. Uh, and, you know, uh, he will release something short and sweet that probably will sound something like I have the best health ever. I'm the healthiest well, person that ever lived. My health is, uh, you know, uh, the best health. I have the best words. I have the best people. I have the best mind. That's what they said. That's what you're going to get. And, of course, you know, he can control what is re released about him. You you want to compare, you know, like uh, the kind of information we got about Barack Obama versus the kind of information we're not going to get about uh, Donald Trump. But it's not going to do any good because he's going to release whatever he wants. And... Quite frankly, he has the right to do that. It's like the one right he will have left. <laughs>
Hurry up, Mueller! Hurry up! I think uh, the two things you really need to read is Michael Wolff's book. If you can do that over the weekend, uh, that would be great. So that we could all talk about it. I think that would be like uh, better than the Oprah Book Club, truly. And this New York Times article. Everything is in the homework section at randyroads.com. And of course, it's all free. So go and avail yourself of some reading material. Print it out and take it to the toilet. You know, we know Saturday and Sunday is a little difficult. You know. Uh, have a good weekend, and uh, we'll regroup here on Monday. And uh, what can I tell you? This is this is going to be a great year, but a scary one. Bye, Stinking Podcast. Go to randyroads.com for the whole thing and a podcast. Bye, Stinking Podcast.